All right, so I found out yesterday that I was teaching this lesson. So it was cram time, and we're doing Colossians 3.18 through 4.18. So that's uh, the end of Colossians 3 and all of chapter 4, which concludes the book of Colossians. Colossians was written around uh, AD 62, which is uh, two to three years before Paul was martyred. So his imprisonment right now is not his final imprisonment, um, but he's not too far out from it. But before we get going, there's a couple of things I'm going to read that are not in Colossians. Uh, it's going to be 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Uh, where it says, But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to what for, to that which is good. And also I'm going to read Acts 17.11. Now, well, actually, we'll start at verse 10. The brethren uh, immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Bera, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, the synagogue of the Jews, oh, sorry, now there, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great uh, eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see what uh, whether these things were so. They were... Uh, diligent. Now, Thessalonians were encouraged to do these things, and they weren't very good at it. Uh, this church, uh, what they're mentioning here in Acts, they were very diligent, and they were making sure that what the uh, Apostle Paul was saying was fact and true. And I encourage everybody to do that uh, when they hear teaching from any pastor or Sunday school leader, um, that they examine what they're saying, search scriptures, uh, compare it to what they're saying, and if, if something's not lining up, then uh, take it with a grain of salt. The Bible is the uh, ultimate authority, so if if I venture off and say something that's not biblical, uh, be diligent to determine that, um, and feel free to let me know. So, Colossians 3, uh, 18 through 21, we're addressing family. Uh, I'm going to start by reading Colossians 3, 18 all the way through chapter 4, just so we can get our premise and then we can break it down from there. Um, wives, be submissive to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be... Uh, embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your master on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it, and sorry, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. As to all, my affairs, uh, Tychius, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information, for I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, 
our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of our one of your number, they will uh, inform you about the whole situation here. Aristicus, uh, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas, cousin Barnabas, Bar Barnabas's cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him, and also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greeting, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and full, fully assured, assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Herapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When, these letter, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the uh, ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. <clears throat> now we're going to try to unpackage this. <laughs> Keep in mind, what God's word is, is pretty straightforward. We want to take it for face value. Then There's not really a hidden message here. What is being said is just as blunt as it could possibly be. Um, but sometimes there's a disconnect in culture. Uh, there's a disconnect in, in uh, understanding what they understand, what we understand, uh, and how things are said. And we, we start off today's lesson with... Uh, Something that causes controversy within families, within uh, early relationships, and that's uh, the role of a wife, the role of a husband, and the role of a child, uh, the role of a father. Um, and a lot of husbands uh, take this one simple verse in 18 and reign it over their wives, and, uh, and thereby not fulfilling the, set, the verse that follows it. Uh, and so let's, let's break that down. So 318, wives, be submissive to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. What does that mean? Any takers on that? What does that mean? All right, so this word submit, see if I can do this without butchering the word, hupotasso. Uh, this word was a Greek word that was used uh, in military as a as somebody who uh, has authority, whether it be a general or a colonel, or somebody in charge of a, a, a group. Uh, the exact quote from the Strong's uh, was, uh, it's a military uh, term meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. However, it was also used in a non-military military use. Uh, it was a, let's see if I can read my own handwriting here, voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. It's this idea of, of uh, recognizing that they have authority over you and being willing to 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 accept that and and to to work with that. Now that does not mean you have to agree with them at all. It really doesn't. Um, and in fact, uh, there are spots in the Bible where it talks about wives who are married to non-believers and what their role is, and it is being submissive, but in a very biblical fashion, in in with the the goal of your submission and your grace and your peace, leading them to the Lord. Um, it's it's a very fine line, um, but this instruction is to the wives. This instruction is not. To to the husbands. It is not the husband's job to enforce this on their wife. It's not their husband's job to dangle this over their head saying, you've got to respect me, the Bible says so. Um, in fact, the husband's role 
follows. Yes, the, the, the role of a family is a, is a beautiful thing. and The Bible spells out what it should look like. And this, this is, we're talking about believers right here. This is, we're, ta we're talking to believers uh, and the role of what a family ought to look like in a believing family. The husband's role is husbands love your wives and do not be embittered against them. This word love, uh, we see it multiple times. It's uh, agapeo. Uh, and that's to welcome, to uh, entertain, to be fond of, to love dearly, to love dearly. I like that term, love dearly. Um, it, it's not this obligation. It, it is. It's supposed to be beautiful. And uh, the embittered, I actually took pictures of the, the, the breakdowns of these because some of them I'm like, I don't, I don't have time to write all this down. Um, so the Strong's definition for, for this uh, uh, being embittered is pakraino. Now, that means uh, to make bitter, to produce a bitter taste in the stomach, to embitter, exasperate, render angry, indignant, to be uh, embittered, uh, irritated, to visit with bitterness, to grieve, deal bitterly with. So this this idea of being bitter towards them and making sure they knew it <laughs> would be a, a good way to, to break it down. Um, you know, Couples get upset with each other. That happens. That's acceptable. But when, when you're holding on to that and you're holding that grudge, you, you've got a bitterness and you're, you're carrying that on. And uh, quite frequently, that bitterness gets passed on and the wife gets the brunt of it. And that happens the other way around, wives with their, with their husbands. Um, but but uh, when, when both parties are doing their part it makes it easy for you to do your part if the husband's loving their wife the way they ought to and not being bitter towards them it's easier for their wife to be submissive uh, to their husbands and likewise if the wife is being submissive to their husbands it's easier for their husbands you know feeling that respect to feel endeared towards their their wife and so it's and if if one is not doing their role it's harder for the other to do their role and then things can just easily fall apart as the saying goes it takes two to tango this particular chapter this particular book when paul's writing to a church he's writing to a church about an issue that they're having already or an issue that he can see sliding and he wants to encourage them to keep going with what they're doing um and, and why he's addressing this at this time i, I am not 100 percent certain uh, when he gets to the slaves, there is some certainty there because uh, he also penned a letter to uh, Philemon, who was an owner of a slave, who was actually mentioned in this chapter of being one's own Onesimus, was a slave who ran away from Philemon, and Philemon was supposed to be gracious to him as a brother. Uh, and so at that same time, uh, I believe when they, they were delivering this letter to Colossae, they were also bringing the letter to, to Philemon. So um, the slave being mentioned, that there is, a, there is a reason for it. As for the husband and wives and sons and daughters and all these different roles, um, I don't know of anywhere where it's specifically saying who has this issue, but clearly somebody has the issue. And so it needs to be addressed, or it may be rampant within the church where husbands are reigning over their wives or wives are being um, really... Uh, disrespectful to their husbands or kids just aren't listening to their parents. I mean, does that really happen? <laughs> it, it has been happening since before the church age. Uh, wives have been submissive because of the laws and stuff that were placed on them, but uh, wives have also been very uh, disrespectful towards their husbands. Likewise, husbands have been very much uh, uh, acting like they are the god of the family and, and reigning it over their, their wives. And, um, and, and so when, when you're following scripture and you're listening to what scripture says and you're doing what scripture says, um, then things can look very beautiful, not perfect. Not always people still, uh, suffer, still, uh, still hurt. Um, but they do it graciously. 
Um, I've seen I've seen many people that they suffer of ailments um, of other people's life decisions, uh, and and are very gracious and and positive about it, and it sometimes blows me away things that people go through and and still maintain a very Christian attitude. Um, moving forward, children, um, and I, I want to point out it starts with the wives here, moves to the husbands. And then it's going to go from the children to the fathers. It always goes back to the man. It always goes back to, okay, guys, you like to reign it over people. Let's, let's talk about how, what kind of attitude you really should have. And it's important for men to understand that, that they have a role. They are not supposed to be the overlord of the family. Um, they are actually very much responsible for them. And if you have an embittered wife, then well, you probably should uh, be better. <laughs> Not that that'll fix it. Being the perfect husband won't necessarily fix your family, but it doesn't hurt to, to try, right? <laughs> it doesn't hurt to try. Children, this is uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 20. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Again, Bible speaks for itself. I mean, it, it, it's pretty clear. Children, be obedient in all things, not in some things. Um, but just because I like looking at Greek words and Hebrew words and seeing the depth that it goes into, um, I did dig into this one for uh, to obey. Um, and that's hupakuo. Probably butchered that one. And that's to listen, to hearken of one uh, who on the knock comes to listen to who it is. The duty of a, uh, uh, what does that say? I wrote this down. Porter, the duty of a porter. And then it falls to, to hearken to a command, to obey, uh, be obedient to, submit. So, the idea here is, is, I mean, when you look at a porter, their job is somebody shows up. They're here. There, there isn't, there isn't waiting. There isn't standing by. It's there. There was a knock. Come, listen, listen to what has to be said and do it. That was that was their responsibility, right? And so, and then it falls up with with to obey, to submit, to, to be obedient. It's this idea of when when your parents tell a kid to do something, there shouldn't be. Uh, a freeze time. It should be an immediate response of obedience. Um, and, and again, we're talking perfect perfection here. <laughs> um, so it's, they're encouraging, we're encouraging the children. This is how you ought to behave with your parents. And, and the word here for, for parents is used for um, anyone who has basically authority over you, whether it be your adopted parents, your parents, your, your grandparents, if, if it's somebody that is, uh, uh, in authority over you, has jurisdiction over you, I guess you could say, then that's the kind of person you should be obeying. Um, and so there's there's that line of respect. And when we, we look at the role of a father, moving into verse 21, fathers do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. That word exasperate could also be stir up, um, and the idea of loose heart uh, also could be read as a breaking spirit. Um, don't break your children's spirit. Um, don't don't arouse them in such a way that you crush their spirits. Uh, when when you do so, then your your kid is is feeling less loved, um, and and they're gonna be less likely to listen to all the instructions you have given them for life and, and potentially even run away from the Lord. And so um, all these rules are put in here for for a reason. And when people disregard these rules, these, I guess not rules, these uh, uh, encouragement to follow, and this is not how you ought to, to behave, um, there's consequences. Um, there's consequences to, to all of our actions. There's consequences to what we do and what we don't do. Um, and we have to we have to face those consequences sometimes, and it's not the easiest thing. 
But uh, when we look at verses 18 through 21, it's this idea of wives, have respect for your husbands. Husbands, love, respect your wives. Children, respect your parents. Dads, show respect to your kids too. Mm-hmm. Different levels of respect. You don't, you don't, husbands ought not talk down to their wives. Husbands ought not talk down to their children. Wives ought not talk down to their husbands. Parent, kids ought definitely not talk down to their parents. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's a family breakdown, 18 through 21. And then we get to, to, to verse 22, and now we're going to start talking to slaves. Now, um, slavery is not a thing in the U.S. anymore, but, um, uh, Working is, and we can apply this same idea to the workforce, to uh, any employee, and, and the role of a master that follows it. Uh, we can easily apply to uh, bosses, to anyone with authority over you. We can apply this to uh, presidents, governors. Uh, apply it in the role of a company owner, a manager, and so on and so forth. So when we read this, we can keep that in mind. Um, and also keep in mind that one of the people that are coming back with this letter is a runaway slave of one of the members of this church. Um, so this this is a instructions to that runaway slave, while at the same time any other slave that's listening, any employee that's listening, any master that's listening, more specifically probably Philemon, who gets his own special letter. <laughs> So we're at uh, Colossians 3, and we're going on to uh, verse 22. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your master. On earth, not with uh, external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work healthily, as for the Lord, rather than for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Uh, For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that within, without partiality. Now, I've been in the workforce for a while now, and I've seen a lot of people who uh, do what is being said not to do here. And that's, uh, they don't work hard until the boss is looking. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're a hard worker again. They're, they're, they work fast, they, they work uh, uh, accurately, and they, they work diligently. But once the boss is out of sight, uh, it's like they go back to eating a sandwich and talking. And um, that's not how it ought to be. Uh, here it's encouraged to recognize who we're truly serving. Um, and this is, this is just true for life in general. Uh, this is true for the husband, for the wife, for the children, cousin, grandparents, uh, employees, doesn't really matter who it is. Um, what we do is for the Lord. When, when we're believers, uh, we live for the Lord. That, that is what we ought to be. And that's a tough, tough calling. Uh, when we look at, at Christ life on earth and the many things that he addressed, uh, a lot of it was dealing with the heart, dealing with your very thoughts. You, you, you think about it. Like he addressed murder. It's like, oh, you, we talk about murder. You, you think of, uh, of you know, call a, call a, what is it, call a brother a uh, fool, basically, and you're guilty of murder. And it's like, it's just because of your attitude towards them, your your, your heart towards them. And, and, and so God's uh, concern is more than just exterior, it's interior. He, he cares about it all. He called the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees a whitewashed tombs. Um, you stink on the inside, you're filthy on the inside, you look great on the outside. He's concerned about both. He's concerned about both. Uh, your inside is very important. What's going on in your head and your heart is very important. And in here, we see what goes on in the heart of some slaves, and we also see um, what goes on uh, exterior with the slaves when when they talk about uh, not pleasing man. You're not doing the work to please your boss. You're not doing your work to please your master. Keep in mind, you're doing this work to to please the master, the Lord. And so uh, do it all as such, knowing that he's always watching but do it joyfully. We're, we're talking about 
um, not just doing it begrudgingly just because, oh, I'm going to do this for the Lord. It's, mm -hmm. it's I get to do this for the Lord. People get to see me and my attitude of how I'm handling my life, how I'm working and how I'm diligently living. Um, and it's pointing to the Lord because that's what I do it for. And so it's, it's really uh, a change of perspective. Because when you go to work day in and day out, you have a boss. And it's very important to keep that boss happy. Um, well, if, if you're doing it unto the Lord, it's next to impossible to not keep that boss happy <laughs> because you're going to be diligent and hard working. Getting into chapter four, unless somebody wanted to comment on that, I do a lot of talking. <laughs> okay. Getting into chapter four, we're going to talk about masters. Now, I want to point out this this word master, this word that we're seeing it throughout um, this section. Uh, wives, submit to your husbands uh, as is fitting to the Lord. That's the same word being used here as master. Um, same thing with the children, that word Lord, same thing as master. Same word uh, with slaves, master. It's, it's all being used as the same word, um, and that word is Kurios or Kurios. Uh, and this is a, a person of authority, uh, a, a master, a uh, governor. Uh, uh, it's also used for, for God and used for the Messiah. Uh, so uh, keep, keep that in mind when we talk about this. So this master, um, this, this person of, of great authority, uh, Grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So there we go, God. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as uh, well that God will open up uh, to us a door for the word so that we may speak from... Uh, Fourth, speak forth the mysteries, I can do this, <laughs> of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. You know, this is one of the things I love about Paul. This is one of the things I love about Paul. He's, he's giving instructions, and, and one of the instructions is to pray, and we, we very much encourage that. We have our prayer meetings on, on Wednesdays, and we uh, every now and then do a prayer concert, um, and we encourage everyone uh, to come if they can. Um. Prayer is important, but what Paul is requesting here is is, is interesting to me, um, simply because he's asking uh, for them to pray for the opportunity to do exactly what put him in prison. <laughs> because that's how committed he is to the cause. He's not worried about being imprisoned. He's he's wants the continued opportunity of what imprisoned him to continue to happen to him while he's in prison. He wants to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what he lives for. So what he is telling people to do, what he's telling the servants to do uh, on diligently working for the Lord, Paul is practicing this. He's very much practicing this. And he, he's telling the, the masters to, to continue praying for them. Um, and praying for the opportunity, just praying for an opportunity to do it. At that point, it's it's Paul's responsibility to step up and take that opportunity. Yes, there there was uh, churches that were being influenced by uh, women because there were uh, different religions uh, in the area. I'm gonna have a hard time remembering which ones they were, but uh, where there was uh, basically house prostitutes, uh, if you will, church church prostitutes, and, and women primarily dominated that religion, and um, some of them were trying to leak in, and I can't remember which church they were trying to leak into for the life of me. Um, but yes, um, that, that was happening in that culture. It's been happening in cultures for a long, long time. He, he, he tells the, the masters to, to vote them, devote themselves to prayer, uh, keeping alert, and uh, to maintain an attitude of thanksgiving. Uh, when you're thankful, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to be harsh and bitter when you're actually being thankful. Um, uh, 
this one of the nice things about Thanksgiving is you kind of see some kindness come out of people. Same thing for Christmas. You see generosity and kindness come out of people. Um, too bad it's not all year round. You see a lot of bitter people walking around. But, but uh, we get that little window of how uh, people can be uh, kind towards one another. And so when he's instructing his these masters to devote themselves to prayer, well, when you're praying, you know, you're you're continuing to align yourself with God and to, to pray with to God and and to maintain that relationship with God. And when you're doing that, how how can you uh, possibly uh, try to go against God? You know, uh, and when you're being when you have an attitude of thanksgiving, how can you you possibly be greedy? Um, or uh, embittered towards people, so it's it's very much a, a kind of a beautiful uh, structure that Paul's building here and explaining to them. Um, it it's like okay, this is how you ought to behave. Uh, this is the attitude you ought to have, and you can't tell you can't tell a person who smokes to stop stop smoking, and then they just quit. Uh, I've talked to many smokers. And that are like, I'm quitting. And I'd see them smoking two days later, three days later, four days later. And I'd be like, I thought you said you were quitting. And I've gotten responses like, I'm no quitter. Or, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. And then <laughs> they'd walk away. It's a, it's a hard habit to kick. Now, if if you can give them a structure of this, these are steps you can take to, to make it easier to quit, um, then that would be useful to them versus being like, hey, just stop. <laughs> And here Paul's giving a structure of how to be a good master, how to be a, a good husband, how to be a good wife, how to be a good ch uh, child, how to be a good servant. Um, he's giving structure to it and giving simple instructions. If you have, in this case, uh, an attitude of thanksgiving, well, it's easier to, to do these instructions that's being given to the master. Anyhow, I beat that one to the ground. Let's move on. Now, bitterness is actually talked about through the Bible, um, and I'm not not touching on that one other than the husbands not to be embittered towards their wives, but um, there is lots of encouragement about um, releasing bitterness. Now, bitterness does um, hold us back, really. Uh, if I had bitterness towards my wife, it would affect her only in the sense that uh, when I show it towards her. Uh, but really, what's affecting is me, um, because it's it's festering. It's causing my attitude to shift, and it, it spreads on to other things in my life. Uh, it would uh, affect my kids. It would affect my workplace because I'm embittered. And so it's it's important to to release bitterness. Um, that's kind of profound. That that's the the role of a husband is not being bitter towards their wife. Um, because if they're embittered towards their wife, it's going to be harder for them to do other other instructions, like the role of a father, not stirring their kids to anger. Because if you're embittered towards your wife, you're gonna <laughs> that anger is going to flow over to your kids, and so it's uh, yeah, bitterness is a tough one, but uh, it, is, it is worth overcoming. Open doors. Let's get into verse four. That uh, no, actually, we did it verse four. Oh, no, we didn't. So he, Paul's asking for them to pray that doors are open to speak forth the mystery of Christ, through which uh, I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Um, he wants he wants to make sure that what he says is being understood. And then continue on with instructions to them. Uh, Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So we're, again, we're talking to believers, right? But he's talking about how to talk to people who are not believers, who are not um, churchgoers. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus. Um, there's there's a appropriate way to, to talk to them. Um and what's interesting is this comes right after him saying uh, to pray for him, to give him the words that they'd be understood. He can say it, you know. Uh, sorry, big fan of Paul. <laughs> uh, but he wants them to conduct themselves with wisdom. 
not just in life, but towards outsiders, towards people who are not believers. Uh, it, it's easy, and we see it in our culture. Um, we see it in our uh, country, in our neighborhood, even where Christians hold um, biblical standards um, to people who don't believe in the Bible. And it's easy for us to do because we're, we're raised believing this is how people ought to live. Um, and while this is true, people ought to, to live this way, uh, they don't believe that there's there's something that they need more than these instructions of um, what to give up and, and how to live and what your attitude ought to be. And that's called the, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for them. That's what they need. They need Jesus. Um and, and that should be the focus. It shouldn't be trying to fix them. You're not going to fix them. You're not. You're not the, the Holy Spirit. You're not going to save them. And it's also important. To, uh, we don't save souls. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Uh, we, our responsibility is to spread the gospel and spread that good news. Um, and so when we deal with outsiders, in this case, we're, we're talking about uh, non-believers, right? Um, we ought to do so with grace. Not being like, oh, you sinner, you need to stop drinking. <laughs> you, you sinner, you need to stop doing drugs. You sinner, you need to stop swearing. We, we can do that all day, um, but it's it's only going to build a wall. Uh, what, what they need to hear is, is the love of Jesus Christ, because that is what saves. Uh, how we talk does not save us. How we behave does not save us. It does not. Jesus Christ saves us. Right? Now, if we want to talk about rewards, that's a whole other ball game. But we're talking about salvation here. That's what truly matters. Once the person's saved, then we can talk about what discipleship looks like. We can talk about uh, what what kind of rewards you can you can get for your your life. Um, but salvation is truly the gift that ought to be spread, and that's very important. Um, so let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so grace and flavorful, <laughs> or preserved, I guess you could put as well, so that you will know uh, how you should respond to each person, because each person's going to be different. Uh, there's, there's people at work that don't believe, and I know I can walk up to them and say, Jesus loves you, and I, I can tell you each person how they would respond. Some would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. And some would be like, don't talk to me about that, Jesus guy. You know, I've, I've, I've got several uh, spectrums at work. They all feel the same. They, yeah, they all. Yeah. Um, and I've worked with guys where if I pushed the topic, they'd push away. And that's not something I want. So I've, I've learned how to, how to work with that person to where they ask the questions when they are ready. Um, and I just make it very clear where I stand. Um, as to all my affairs, Tychius. So now we're going to get into those who are coming out to him. Um, Tychius has a special role. He's delivering these letters, but he's also he's a witness uh, of what's going on with Paul. So he's going to be uh, letting them know uh, what's going on with Paul, what Paul's been doing, what he's been up to. It's kind of like when we have a missionary come out here and they say, this is what we've been up to. This is instead, this is like the, the missionary's liaison. They're going to come and he's going to say, yeah, this is, Paul couldn't make it. He's he's in jail. <laughs> but this is what he's been doing. This is what he's been up to. This is what he's struggling with. This is where he can use prayer. Uh, this is what he's doing that he's encouraged. Uh, this is what he can uh, that what he can use to be encouraged. And and so, you got a messenger here uh, from Paul to pass this on. Tychius, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. Um, if we had uh, somebody we supported, somebody we cared about um, that uh, we know is in prison because of uh, the gospel, it's, uh, it's easy to be disheartened. Like, oh, they're in, okay. It's easy to be disheartened because they're in prison. Um, 
And so the purpose of Tiki's coming is to encourage them so that they're not disheartened, to re recognize that the gospel is still being taught, even in prison. Uh, in fact, Paul's imprisonment uh, did eventually lead to uh, salvation to the palace guard, which is, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> like, oh, we're, we're going to have to watch you in prison because of what you did with us. <laughs> it's a it's kind of interesting, but it's an opportunity. He sees the opportunity, he takes the opportunity. Um, uh, for this purpose, that you may be encouraged. Okay, and then verse 9 of chapter 4, and with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, uh, they will inform you about the whole situation here. So Onesimus is that slave, the runaway slave. Um, he's the one who belongs to Philemon. Uh, he, he ran away, uh, presumably, possibly stole something. It's not uncommon for slaves when they run away to take something with them. Uh, essentially, he did steal something. He stole himself because he was the property of Philemon and he ran away. Um, but he... He came in contact with Paul, and uh, Paul uh, eventually converted him, and now he's a brother. And now that he's uh, a brother and in right standing, he is willingly returning to his master. And that's important to note. Verse 10, uh, Arist Aristarchus. Uh, my fellow prisoner sends you his greetings and also Barnabas's cousin Mark, uh, about whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now, Mark is that same person that Paul had issues with before on that first missionary journey that you know, they, he departed from them while they were in the midst of doing their mission work. And so uh, it eventually created a uh, spat between Barnabas and Paul. Because uh, Barnabas is like, let's take him with us. And Paul's like, I am not working with that guy again. <laughs> he abandoned us. Um, since then, that relationship has been uh, mended. And, and the, really, <laughs> the relationship has been mended. And uh, Paul and Mark get along now. In fact, Mark is considered valuable to Paul. Uh, and also Jesus, not Jesus Christ. Jesus was a common name back then. Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers uh, for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision. And they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, and if I remember right, he was actually the founder of the church this letter is going to. A bonds slave of Jesus Christ sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. Again, praying is very important. That you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and uh, Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician who wrote Acts and Luke, um, sends you his greetings. And also Demas, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha, Nympha and the church uh, that is in her house. When the letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, uh, for your part, read the letter that is coming from Laodicea. So to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. So he just listed a bunch of people who are with him uh, and several people who are going to deliver these letters that can bear witness that Paul wrote this. <laughs> um so he's got his witnesses, he's got his, he's got his marching orders that he's given, um, he's broken down what a family looks like, what employment looks like, what uh, being a boss ought to look like. Uh, we're, we're really called to be gracious, we're really called to share the gospel and take the opportunity to share the gospel. Um, our, our very actions ought to uh, be that which points to the gospel, uh, to the Lord. Um, and so... Uh, now we see here 
where it addresses the heart of the matter, but also the, the physical aspect of, of how we ought to behave. And that concludes the lesson.